Thanks, Tom, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll try and give you a bit of an introduction to who we are at Renewron. Um, I know some of you may have seen a presentation similar to this in the past, uh, uh, so apologies for going over some old ground. And for those of you that don't know what we do, hopefully you'll find uh, something of interest here. Um, we're a public company, so there's the standard disclaimer statement in all its glory. Um, so we are a leader in cell-based therapeutics. So what we're trying to do is harness the scientific and medical power, if you like, of stem cells, which reside in all of us, um, and try and convert that very exciting science into therapeutic products that can be made, expanded, shipped, and stored uh, in a way that's going to be clinically and commercially relevant. We're based in the UK, and we also have operations in the US. We're developing stem cell therapies which are allogeneic, which means they are non-patient specific. So we're not reliant on the patient's own stem cells to treat them with. Um, this is a standardized biopharmaceutical product, if you will, that can be administered to any patient that presents with the diseases that we're targeting. And we have two clinical stage candidates that uh, we are targeting against unmet medical needs, as you'll see, and some very important clinical milestones coming up um, over the next 24 months, and I'll come to those in, uh, in detail a little later. Uh, so we have two core cell therapy assets, one of which we call HRPC at the top there, and the other one is called CTX. Um, HRPC stands for human retinal progenitor cells. These are um, uh, progenitor photoreceptors, uh, which are the cells that give us sight at the back of the eye. And um, unsurprisingly, we're targeting these cells at back of the eye retinal degenerative diseases. Uh, the first target is a disease called retinitis pigmentosa, which I'll come to, and we have some positive early phase 2A data uh, in that indication, uh, and I'll take you through those data uh, later. Uh, the second asset, CTX, um, again, is a progenitor, uh, so a multipotent stem cell line. It has the ability to differentiate, in other words, um, and in this case, it's manufactured or scaled in a slightly different way. It's an engineered line, so it's immortalized with proprietary technology that we've developed over many years and optimized. Um, and these neural cells, uh, unsurprisingly, again, are being targeted at neurodegenerative conditions um, or uh, conditions associated with damage in the brain. And for CTX, our first target is stroke disability. Uh, and again, we have positive phase 2A data in that indication and a phase 2B study currently underway or ongoing, actually, in the US. Um, both of these assets have actually been partnered with Fosun Pharma, which is a top three pharma company uh, in uh, China, and we've given them exclusive rights for that territory alone to both uh, manufacture and commercialize these two assets uh, in that territory. And that was a license deal we signed uh, just under a year ago. Um, we have a, also a research uh, function in the business, and there we're really targeting exosomes and induced pluripotent cells derived from our CTX cell line. Uh, don't worry too much about the terminology. If there's time at the end, I'll take you through some of those research programs, which we're extremely excited about. And indeed, these are growing uh, endeavors in the broader field in terms of harnessing exosomes and induced pluripotent cells, both therapeutically uh, and as a novel new way of delivering advanced drugs. But again, I'll try and come back to that a little later towards the end. Uh, so our clinical pipeline is uh, tight, uh, as you see here. Two programs with two assets targeting two very specific indications, uh, both in phase two, so mid-clinical stage development. So again, uh, for those of you not familiar with the biotech model, uh, we raise money from the market. We're then um, paid to deliver clinical data from, we hope, well-designed clinical studies that will give an unequivocal answer. Do these therapeutic candidates work uh, in a statistically significant way in these clinical trials? And if they do, that's where the real value is for us, our shareholders, and other stakeholders. Um, so I'll come to each of these programs in turn, starting with the HRPC cell uh, program targeting retinitis pigmentosa. And as I mentioned, our HRPCs uh, are retinal cells. They have the ability to differentiate, because they're stem cells, uh, into photoreceptors, the rods and cones that we have at the back of the eye that give us sight in, in the retina. 
Um, and we've shown preclinically that these cells do have the ability to differentiate and engraft. So the notion here is really to use these HRPCs to replace the rods and cones or photoreceptors that are lost in retinal degenerative diseases such as uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, importantly for us, and it's been a, one of the sort of founding philosophies of the company, uh, in order to embark on a stem cell therapy program, we want to ensure not only that we have the ability to garner decent clinical data, but that we have the means to manufacture or expand and, if you like, um, uh, optimise uh, these, these cells, these cell therapy, cell therapy candidates, in a way that's going to be commercially relevant, something that can be manufactured or scaled at a cost of goods that's going to be interesting interesting to a, 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 a commercial development partner in due course and conceivably will be paid for by healthcare systems in the West and beyond. And we believe we've cracked those two very important things, the clinical and commercial uh, aspects of cell therapy uh, with both of our candidates. Um, for us, that involves uh, cryopreserving these cell therapy candidates so they can be shipped and stored uh, and then used when required, thawed and used at the hospital uh, when required, and, and cryopreservation <coughs> also allows economies of scale in batch manufacture as well. You can generate larger batches, freeze them down under a long shelf life, uh, and that obviously provides for, for a lower cost of goods uh, in due course. So just a bit about retinitis pigmentosa as the first target for these HRPC cells. It is an unmet medical need or a largely unmet medical need. There is actually one approved treatment now for a very narrow subset of the retinitis pigmentosa population, um, and that's Lux Turner. You may have seen the news last night. Uh, the NHS, it's been actually approved by NICE now or recommended by NICE for uh, pricing in the NHS, and the first candidate was uh, treated with Lux Turner uh, um, uh, a day or two ago here in the UK. And Lux Turner is a, is a gene therapy that targets one of the, the over 100 gene deficiencies that goes up collectively to make the RP population. What we're trying to do with our HRPCs is address the entirety of that patient population with a non-gene dependent approach. So in other words, we're not necessarily getting at the underlying genetic cause of this condition, but what we're addressing are the consequences of that gene defect in terms of loss of photoreceptors over time. And ultimately, as you see in the images here on the right, uh, it's a it manifests itself in a gradual loss of peripheral vision and then uh, blindness uh, results. And this can take many, many years, actually, to uh, progress as a, as a condition. It's an orphan uh, uh, um, uh, program, which means that it, um, it's a relatively rare condition, although as an orphan drug, this is actually one of the larger patient populations that would qualify uh, for orphan drug designation, as indeed our program has in, in both Europe and the US, and we also have FDA fast track designation as well. So in other words, it provides perhaps a swifter, more efficient route through the regulatory process to market, and orphan drugs also command a degree of market exclusivity under certain conditions if they do reach the market as well. And that makes this kind of program attractive to potential licensees, partners, uh, because although the po patient populations may be smaller, the time to market typically can be quicker and the pricing can be higher because of that as well. Um, so I won't take you through the preclinical data. Uh, suffice to say that we spent a good, a good, good deal of time generating the IND enabling preclinical work to show that these retinal cells did indeed engender a positive effect or efficacy in valid preclinical models in both small animals, rats, and also uh, in larger animals as well. Uh, we did work in pigs, uh, which has a, an eye of similar size to, to the human eye, to show that these cells could engraft and, and migrate throughout the subretinal space as we wanted them to. And ultimately, these data enabled us to get into the clinic. And that's where we currently are with this program. We're currently in the middle of a phase 1 2A study being run in two sites in the US. Um, the phase one elements completed, that was in 12 patients. It was a dose, escalate, dose escalation part of the study showing the safety primarily of this treatment at increasing doses uh, through those 12 patients. We weren't looking for any efficacy in these patients. They were actually too far progressed with their disease for that to be uh, possible. Um, but having showed safety in, that, in those first patient groups, it led us into the phase two element which we're currently uh, in the middle of. We've treated 10 patients so far, and we announced very, very uh, interesting data 
uh, which uh, engendered a lot of interest actually in the market um, last year uh, in the patients that we treated in, sh in terms of showing uh, an efficacy signal in those patients in the phase 2A part of this study. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, we've, we've treated 10 patients so far. Uh, the treatment appears to have a good safety profile, no immune-related adverse events. Bear in mind that, you know, these cells are not the patient's own cells, um, so they are allogeneic, but they don't engender an immune response, and neither does our other cell product, CTX, either. And indeed, we don't have to immunosuppress the patients when administering these cells. In this case, the cells were implanted through um, subretinal surgery, uh, which sounds pretty grim, well it is quite grim, but it's a relatively straightforward procedure, so the patient will stay in uh, typically for a day, uh, maybe stay overnight, and, and then they're back home. Uh, we had a couple of patients where the surgical procedure um, was such that the patients weren't going to respond, and again, this is not atypical with this type of subretinal surgical procedure, uh, and it's one of the things we'd like to address as we move forward with this study, uh, to ensure that we're selecting patients who do stand the best chance of responding to the treatment, both in terms of the effect of the cells and uh, being responsive to the surgical procedure itself, where there is always uh, a degree of risk, of course. Um, but we're very encouraged by what we've seen from an efficacy standpoint. And again, I won't take you through the data in any great detail. Suffice to say that um, one of the ways of measuring efficacy in retinal degenerative diseases or in clinical studies of this type um, is measuring a patient's ability to read down an ETDRS chart, which is what you see in the panel uh, on the right-hand side there. Um, and we've seen a very uh, clear efficacy signal against the baseline untreated eye and the baseline treated eye uh, in these uh, patients. So one eye gets the treatment, the other eye doesn't. So there's a kind of natural control, but it's, this is not a controlled study. I should add, it's not a placebo-controlled study. It's a single arm uh, 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 study. Um, but, but the efficacy against those levels of baseline vision is certainly very, very uh, encouraging. And you see the end numbers here. Um, and this study, of course, is still reading out. And we're hoping to give another update uh, quite shortly. So, so look out for that. Um, and again, next steps, well, as I mentioned, is to generate further data from this study. Uh, we did flag in our interim results, actually, a couple of months ago that we wanted to um, enlarge this study and build on the data that, that's already coming from this study. And really, that's a way to ensure that we get the best possible set of results from this study as a gateway to going in what, to what we hope will be a single pivotal study that gets us to market, again, assuming the data is positive as we go forward. And again, that's very much leveraging the orphan drug designation that we have and the ability to, if you like, jump a step, perhaps, um, in terms of the normal clinical trial uh, uh, progression that you would typically find for, for more conventional drugs, especially non-orphan drugs. Um, so again, further readouts due this year. Um, one of the other things we'd like to do as well, subject to resources in the company, is to open out this platform, this HRPC platform, to other related indications, and cone rod dystrophy uh, is, a, is, is a related uh, indication, another genetic disease associated uh, or closely associated with um, retinal degeneration. Okay, so... Um, so much for HRPCs. Just a quick word on CTX and how we're leverage, leveraging this platform. And again, we do see both of these cell assets as platforms uh, able to be applied to more than the clinical targets we're currently uh, uh, working on. Um, CTX, as I mentioned, is a cryopreserved allogeneic um, stem cell therapy candidate. So again, we've spent many years optimizing uh, the way that we expand these cells, freeze them down, ship and store, and so on. Again, trying to, if you like, make these natural cell products or product candidates as close as we can to a more conventional biopharmaceutical, like an antibody, for instance. Uh, and we think we've cracked most of the key uh, uh, issues associated with that over the many years of work we've put into both of these assets. In terms of how um, CTX works in the brain, Whereas our HRPCs, we think, can engraft and actually differentiate and replace lost photoreceptors, what we believe is happening with CTX, and there is published work to support this, is that CTX, in common with other stem cell types, 
um, they're engendering natural repair mechanisms. So these are paracrine effects. They're trophic mechanisms. So rather than cell replacement, what they're doing is signaling. Probably it's the exosomes within the cells that are mediating that cell-to-cell -cell signaling. And they're signaling to neighboring resident cells, if you will, um, to stimulate self-repair in the brain. And they do that by stimulating neurogenesis, repair of, or sorry, generation of new neurons, angiogenesis, which is promotion of blood vessel growth. And these cells also have an ability to modulate the immune system as well, to dampen down the effects caused in the post-stroke um, uh, cascade, which is perhaps more relevant to acute stroke than downstream stroke. Um, anyway, uh, multimodal mechanisms of action, and again, there's nothing particularly unusual about CTX in that regard. Many stem cell therapies exert their effects through a number of different mechanisms, most of which, it's fair to say, are not well elucidated uh, at this point. Nonetheless, if you can show an effect, that's, uh, that doesn't necessarily matter. Um, getting things through the clinic and approved, ultimately, is what really matters for a, for a business like ours. Um, so we're targeting stroke disability, uh, which is a major, major unmet medical need. Uh, most drug treatments have targeted stroke in the acute phase. Most of them have failed for that reason. It's extremely difficult to show a beneficial effect with an acute stroke treatment um, against uh, a placebo where you're going to have very significant natural repair going on at the same time uh, because a lot of stroke patients will recover, some completely and and others um, to a degree from their, from their initial stroke if they don't die from it. Um, what we're looking to, to do is to treat the patients that have survived their stroke but are left with a residual deficit, a residual disability or inability to move on one side of the body um, as a result of their stroke. Um, and again, that's a very, very significant patient population and one that costs <laughs> the health and care, social care systems in the developed world a huge amount of money on an annual basis. So there's a very strong pharmacoeconomic reason as well as a clinical and quality of life reason for uh, pursuing this. And one of the ways of measuring this, uh, measuring how you get an effect with a treatment against disability at a clinical level, is by the use of a scale called the Modified Rankin Scale. Uh, this is the, the primary endpoint we're using actually in our ongoing Phase 2B study in the US, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, and really it measures, it's a, it's a measure of dependence. And the higher you are up on this uh, six-point scale, um, it's actually naught to five, uh, so six points in total. Um, the higher you're up on this scale, the more dependent you are, as you can sort of see in the images, if you can see those on the, uh, on the, on the, on the right-hand side there. And pharmacoeconomically, the biggest benefit you can get is by reducing patients' dependence from MRS 4 to 3 or 3 to 2. And you can see that on the graph here. If you, I'm not sure how easy it is to read. It's actually a, taken from a registry study of disabled patients uh, that was published a couple of years ago in Sweden. And it just shows you the, the very significant pharmacoeconomic benefits of dropping patients' level of dependence, making them less dependent on care, ultimately, as a result of their disability. And that's the essence of our CTX treatment uh, targeting stroke disability. Um, we've done two clinical trials in the, US, in the UK, rather, before we embarked on our ongoing study in the US. This is the last study we did in the UK, a 2A study. It was actually published. Uh, a few days ago, it's online in the uh, BMA, uh, sorry, BMJ Journal of Neurology, uh, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry, for those interested in the, uh, the actual published work. This is a snapshot of the data that we generated, and it shows a very interesting uh, and significant effect against modified Rankin, uh, that measure of dependence, in the patients that we treated against their baseline level of disability. So again, this is not a controlled study with a placebo group, the study in the US does have a placebo group, but this was a single arm study um, and we're monitoring patients really over time against their own baseline level of uh, disability. And interestingly, um, there was a pre-specified patient group that had no upper arm movement going into this study. And if we exclude those patients who had no upper arm movement going in, then the, uh, uh, the, the response rate on modified ranking in the remaining patients in this study is commensurately higher. And intuitively, you might expect that, because if you've got really no ability to move, uh, then it suggests that you won't really be responsive to the treatment. Perhaps there's no surviving cortical spinal tract. So that seemed to bear itself out in the numbers here, although the end numbers clearly are quite small. Um, but nonetheless, that's caused us to um, exclude patients with no upper arm movement in the ongoing Pisces 3 study, which is a phase 2B randomized placebo-controlled study currently 
ongoing in the US. And you can see the inclusion criteria there on the uh, left-hand panel shows that there must be some residual upper arm movement. 130 subjects, two to one randomized to either the, the treatment or placebo sham surgery. And again, modified Matt Rankin is the primary endpoint with a number of secondary endpoints typically used in, in studies of stroke disability and disability more generally. Um, there's a large number of surgical and treatment sites recruiting this study in the US right now and all being well, subject to recruitment speed, uh, we'd hope to, uh, uh, to have top-line data at some point in the middle of next calendar year. I've got one minute left, so I'm just going to spend one minute, one minute rather, um, trying to explain how exciting uh, exosome technology is, uh, but I'm not really going to have time to do that, and it's above my pay grade anyway, because I'm not a scientist by training. Um, suffice to say, exosomes derived from cells is an emerging field both in terms of the use of exosomes as a therapeutic agent or as a carrier, a delivery vehicle for delivering advanced drugs. And collaboratively with third-party pharma companies, we're pursuing the latter route currently with our exosomes derived from CTX cells. So working with companies using our exosomes to deliver their complex drugs, uh, be they gene therapies and the like, uh, as an alternative to other uh, delivery vehicles, AAV vectors and the like. Um, induced pluripotent cells, finally, uh, again, these are derived from our own CTX cell line. Induced pluripotent cells, again, are, have engendered a lot of interest in the field over recent years. Um, they're embryonic cells without the ethical issues that go with embryonic cells. So they're induced to have an embryonic, uh, embryonic stem cell-like uh, characteristics. We've shown that we're able to reprogram our CTX cells into an embryonic state, so we call them CTX iPSCs. Um, and then beyond that, we can then take those iPSCs down new cell lineages like MSCs. And again, you can't really see that, but those are cell surface markers demonstrating that we can derive a mesenchymal or a bone marrow cell from an original neural progenitor. Why is that exciting? Well, it obviously opens up the way to license these new lines to third parties that may require them. And we can also generate exosomes from these new cell lines as well and target them at specific tissues. So again, it's, if you like, it's Renuron Mark II um, uh, uh, as a way of broadening out our pipeline, but very much using the assets we already have, in this case, our CTX cell line. So wrapping up in... 10 seconds. We're a global leader in cell therapy. Uh, we're working with allogeneic stem cell technology platforms, something that uh, we believe uh, ultimately can uh, get to market. Um, we're targeting significant diseases. There are unmet medical needs. Uh, we have some interesting clinical milestones due both this year and next, and we, we see near-term opportunities for value-generating deals. Uh, our deal with Fosun Pharma was an a first example of that last year with our cell therapy assets. Uh, and with that, I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. So we'll open it up to questions now. Just time for a couple of questions. Um, we've got one question there, I think. And one at the back there. We'll come to you next. Hello. Can I, hello. Can I uh, ask you something you never actually touched upon? But... Yesterday's announcement from Novartis, they uh, suggested a price point for their treatment of £600,000. Do you have a price point that you're aiming at for your treatment? We I don't. Know. It's a, it's an interesting point. I mean, Luxturn is actually priced at $425,000 per eye in the US. Um, so maybe slightly less than that uh, as a NICE recommendation. But NICE have recommended it for use in the NHS, as, as you know. Um, we don't have a price point for ours yet, um, but I think what we've tried to do, as I mentioned, is develop a cell therapy that we can manufacture at relatively low cost of goods. And there's a very good reason for that, because we believe that pricing will come, well, it already is coming under pressure, even for the more expensive novel drugs, advanced therapies, the gene therapies and, and the like. Um, and that pressure is only gonna continue. So we think we have a very, very good cushion in terms of how we will ultimately set the price for our therapies, because we can make them far, far more cheaply than some of the gene therapies and CAR-T therapies that are making their way to market now. And that, as I said, that's been the essence of the company's philosophy almost from the get-go 20 years ago. Can you develop allogeneic cell therapies that you can scale up and, and make on a, on a sort of per-dose basis at a cost of goods, which is really you know, akin to a more conventional 
uh, biopharmaceutical drug. So that, that brings me to my other point. Are you actually discussing with NICE at the moment where the price point should be and do you have more margin to play with than the likes of Novartis? If it and do we have more what, sorry? Margin. Yeah, uh, the answer to that is yes, we do. Um, I think we, in our own models and those of our analysts that follow us, um, if, you, if, you, if you ever see some of that research, assume pricing for our treatments that are much lower uh, than Lux Turner. But what you have to remember is Lux Turner's treating you know, a very, very small patient population. It's probably no more than a few thousand patients uh, eligible with that RPE65 gene deficiency. So obviously on a per patient basis, for exquisite, exquisitely good efficacy, um, you're going to command a commensurately higher price. For us, we're treating much larger patient populations if we get to market, and the pricing will reflect that. But it's a larger potential patient pool that, that can take the treatment. Great. So it's kind of horses for courses. Bottom line, we're very comfortable with our ability to price these products if we can show the requisite clinical efficacy. Just squeeze in one more question before we run out of time. So just in the, I think somebody, yeah. Um, Sorry, sir. There was somebody just behind you who kind of put their hand up. So presumably uh, there is a spectrum of retinitis pigmentosa from early to advanced disease with a long natural history and evolution. Are you targeting the early stages of retinitis pigmentosa rather than the advanced disease in which you, I think, indicated that you hadn't seen any efficacy, albeit in a study which was principally for for safety. So are the subsets that you identified might benefit and what, what proportion of retinitis pigmentosa might those subsets represent? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the simplest answer to that is that's precisely what our current ongoing phase 2A study is about. So you're absolutely right. There's actually, even within that relatively small study, there's quite a variation in baseline level of visual acuity in those patients. And it, it's incredibly difficult to draw any strong conclusions from N numbers that small. It looks at the moment like the treatment might respond better to patients that are slightly more progressed with their disease, but not too far progressed. But, and intuitively, that might make some sense because there's more damage to work on. And, you know, if you've got very, very low vision, you know, you've got a chance of, you know, a greater proportionate um, improvement, if you like than if you're fairly mild uh, or early on in your progression where essentially the cells have got, well, less disease to work on. So, but I, again, that's what we're seeing, you know, anecdotally, um, but we would have to treat more patients and try and stratify those patients and the results uh, in more detail. And there may even be an element of that uh, in a subsequent study as well. Um, so it's early days, but, but you're absolutely right, ultimately, we, we would very much hope we can identify a patient subgroup that are the best responders. And that's typically what mid-stage clinical development's about. Great. Thank you very much. That, that's all the time we have for questions just now. But as I said, you should be able to, to chat to Michael afterwards. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.